احمده و نسلی علی رسوله الکریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي بذيغ من اخلي اللهم فقهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين ورس 31 وقل المؤمنات يغضذن من ابصارهن ويحفظن فروجهن ولا يبدين زينتهن الا ما ظهر منها وليضربن بخمرهن على جيوبهن ولا يبدين زينتهن الا لبعولتهن Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and tell the believing women to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts and not expose their adornments except that which necessarily appears thereof and to wrap a portion of their head covers over their chests and not expose their adornments except to their husbands their fathers their husbands fathers their sons their husbands sons their brothers their brothers sons their sisters sons their women that which their right hands possess or those male attendants having no physical desire or children who are not yet aware of the private aspects of women and let them not stamp their feet to make known what they conceal of their adornments and turn to Allah in repentance all of you O believers that you might succeed so in this verse 31 of surah an-nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all knowing all seeing all merciful has given few commandments to the muslim women and to start with the verse are two commandments which were also given to the muslim men and these two are to um, they allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked all the believing muslim women to reduce some of their visions and that is and guarding their private parts these are the same two orders which were given in verse 30 to all the muslim men also so there is a similar order of lowering of gaze for the muslim women like um, it has been uh, asked the muslim women have also been told that if their gaze comes up to a thing which is not lawful for them which is not permissible for them or it is haram for them to see this so may it be any part of uh, the other person's body of the satar of the next person or it may be any picture any image any scene of a, of a movie or anything may it be in the social media when they're all by themselves but because of the fear of allah if their gaze falls on something which is not lawful and permissible for them to see then they should they should lower down their gaze and the orders will be the same as we have already discussed in verse number 30 similarly there is a tradition which has been reported uh, by uh, for prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that hazrat umm salma and hazrat umm maimuna uh, radhiyallahu ta'ala anha they they were the wives of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, there was a companion they were sitting with prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that a companion he came and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he asked his wives to conceal their faces from him and both of them they said that o messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is he not blind and uh, he will not see us or he will not recognize us and thereupon prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam immediately remarked are you too are you too also blind do you not see him 
and uh, this has been reported in Muslim Ahmad and Abu Dawood in Tirmizi. Similarly, there is also a tradition in Mota reported by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that uh, there was a blind man who came to see Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she was there with him and she observed Parda from him. And uh, when one of the companions asked that why had she observed Parda from a uh, from a blind man, she said that I do see him. So this is also an order for the Muslim women to restrain their gaze and also to guard their private parts. And then after this is the next do. There is a do, and then there is a don't. So the do, uh, the first do is. This is an order and a commandment for all the Muslim women. And the order is that they should do what? That with their khamar. What is this khamar? This khamar is a plural of khamar and it refers to the head covers or the head dresses. And the jayub is the plural of jayb. And jab refers to the part of the chest, which is adjacent to the neck. So what here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Muslim women is that their head covers or their head dresses, which they, which, with which they cover up their head, they should now do what? They should also cover it up and wrap it around their chest. Why has this been ordered? Because the chest of the women itself is a point of beauty and it is a source of attraction. And the norm with the Arab women used to be that they used to cover their heads with their head covers or the headdresses and they used to knot them up and uh, throw them at their backs, thus exposing their necks and the chests. So here in this verse, the Muslim women have been ordered this manner of adopting or wrapping around their head covers or their headdresses around their chests also. <coughs> we uh, do come across people who comment that nowhere, eh, nowhere in Quran is it ordered or is it mentioned in any verse that Muslim women, they need to cover their heads. So remember, remember the reference of this verse number one, uh, verse number 31 of Surah Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught all the Muslim women how they are supposed to wrap their headdresses and how they have to use their head covers. So this is a do of Quran for all the Muslim women when they are at home, even in front of their seven mehram relations, um, obviously other than, other than their husbands. <coughs> because we do realize that the satar of uh, Muslim women with respect to men is the entire body, excluding only the hand and the face, which should not be exposed before any other man, not even uh, her brother, her father, except the husband. And the woman is not allowed to wear transparent or thin or tight fitting dresses, which might reveal the skin or outlines of her body or the figure also. According to a tradition from Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, it has been reported in uh, Abu Dawood that uh, once her sister, Hazrat Asma bin Tabi Bakar, she came before Prophet Sallallahu and she was clad in a dress which was slightly transparent. And Prophet Sallallahu immediately turned his face away. And he said that, O oh, Asma, when a woman has attained maturity, it is not permissible that any part of her body should be exposed except the face and the hand. So this is a total explanation of this part of the verse also. And uh, it has been reported by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that after the order of this verse and after the command which was, um, which was explained for the Muslim women in this verse, which it had been described, what happened in the Islamic Republic of uh, Medina was, she states that when Surah Nur was revealed, and the companions, they learned of its contents from Prophet Sallallahu they immediately went back to their houses and they recited the verses before their wives, their daughters and their sisters. And there was an instantaneous response. And the response was what? The women of Insar, these were obviously the women who could understand the language and the words, the words of the verse. So the women of Insar, one and all, this is what has been reported by Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. 
She said that the women of Ansar, one and all, they immediately got up and they made wrappers from whatever piece of cloth that was handy or available for them. And the next morning, all the women who came up to Prophet Salaam's mosque for the prayer, they were dressed in wrappers. And in another tradition, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her says that uh, transparent and thin clothes, they were discarded and the women selected only coarse, thick clothes for this purpose. And it has been reported in Ibn Kathir and Abu Dawud also. And so the very nature, the very nature and the object of the command demanded that the wrappers should not be made out of fine and transparent cloth. The women of Ansar, they immediately understood the real object of the order and they knew which type of cloth was intended to be used also. And not only this, but Prophet Sallallahu himself has clarified this and he did not leave it for just for the people to be interpreted by what type of cloth was needed for this purpose. As has been reported in uh, Abu Dawood, that uh, Dahiya Qalbi, he states that uh, once a uh, length of fine Egyptian muslin was presented to Prophet Sallallahu and he gave a piece of it, uh, it to me and he said that use one part of it for your shirt and give the rest of it to your wife for a wrapper, but do tell her that she should stitch another piece of cloth on the inner side so that the body may not be revealed through it. So these were the orders which had, uh, this, the, this was the manner how the orders were obeyed after the commandment of, um, after the commandment of this verse. So this is, I again repeat, this teaches all the Muslim women, even inside their houses, even in front of their mehram relations, their mehram men relations, other than their husband, to cover up their head and also their chest, to um, prevent them revealing any form of their physical and bodily figure and their physical uh, adornments and attractive uh, figures also. And the second uh, uh, order here in this verse is a don't of Quran. And Allah says, Wala yubdina zina tahunna. This is mentioned, these words are mentioned twice in this verse. And so it is a very important don't of the Quran for all the Muslim women. And what is this don't is that they have been ordered and they've been said that do not expose their adornments. And saying this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has then given a complete list of people a complete list of people whose presence a Muslim woman can demonstrate her adornments freely. And this list, I will read again, that they will they are allowed to expose their adornments to their husbands and to their fathers and their husband's fathers, that is the father-in-law, and their sons and their husband's sons, that is the stepson, and their brothers, their brothers' sons and their sisters' sons, that is their nephews, and the women, that which their right hands possess, this means what? Their slave women and their female attendants. And uh, that women and their women, their women means what? The women, the Muslim women are those male attendants who have no physical desires or children who are not yet aware of the private aspects of the women. That is the young children, uh, the boys who have not yet reached maturity. So what we need to know from this verse is that what is meant by an, an adornment for the women? Because that is a clear cut don't that all the Muslim women, they are not supposed to exhibit or demonstrate or show off any form of their adornments beyond this, beyond this very strictly um, explained um, list of people around a Muslim woman. So the first thing which we need to understand is what is meant by zina, the hunna, that is adornments. Zenith is, it refers to all the things, all the things which increase the beauty of a woman and make the woman look prettier, more beautiful, and more attractive. Anything which will beautify a woman is her zina, and this is what this is her adornment, and this is what she is not supposed to exhibit beyond this list. Now, what will we consider as our adornments. I will want to talk from head to toe 
and I will keep on highlighting a few things which will we, we will discuss mutually whether they are in the list of our adornments or they are not. So the first thing, starting from head to toe, the hair. Hair. Uh, do, do the beautiful, long, silky, shiny tresses, do they add to the attraction of the woman? Or our beautiful, long hair, uh, are they a source of adding to our beauty? For sure they are. Because if, if it's not so, then why do the women folk, they get all their hair dyes and their treatments and rebondings and straightenings and all those expensive cuts? So why, why not? Obviously, the hairstyle makes the women look beautiful and more attractive and more catchy. And they definitely add to the beauty of a woman. And there's no doubt about it. Similarly, the next thing, the makeup all forms of cosmetics. May it be the mascaras or the eyeliners, the eyeshadows, the blush-ons, the lip colors. So wearing all forms of makeups surely does enhance the look of a woman. And so for all forms of makeups and cosmetics also is a don't of Quran not to exhibit or show off all these cosmetics beyond this explained circle of the Quran. Then the next is jewelries. Jewelries, you will all agree with me that whatever form of jewelry is worn, they will definitely beautify a woman. And a woman with the jewelry for sure looks more attractive and more, more beautiful and prettier as compared to when she does not wear any forms of jewelry. And then the next thing is the garments, the dresses. There is again no doubt that dresses do add to the beauty for all of us and the amount of money and time and effort which is spent by the women to beautify their dresses is just because a dress makes her look pretty prettier prettiest so there is a no to this also there is a no there is a law to showing off and demonstration of all the garments the beautiful adorned garments of the muslim women beyond this circle also and then last but not the least, the face. The face of the woman is the most beautiful part of our body. And the most, the, more, the part of the body we women folk are, the most sensitive about the beauty is the beauty of our face. The most we are careful and mindful about the beauty, the part of the body we are mindful and sensitive about the beauty, about the spots, about the wrinkles is about the beauty of our face. So that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered all of us to conceal all those things. May it be our hair, our hairstyles, our cosmetics, our jewelry, our garments and our dresses or our faces, our beautiful faces. They have to be concealed. They are all the adornments beyond this specialized circle. And this specialized circle is even all the all the other men, except the seven seven mehram male relatives with whom we know that nikah is not permissible. Beyond these seven mehram uh, male relatives of the women, all the men folk, the women, they do not have to reveal their adornments, and the Muslim women and all the children and their maid servants and the list we've already gone through. Remember. A Muslim woman, she cannot reveal her adornments when even in front of the non-Muslim women, not even in front of the non-Muslim women and young boys that is pre pubertal boys who are young and who do not who do not understand all the private aspects of women, their the adornments can be revealed. And similarly, extremely old attendants who are staying at their houses also in front of them also. And they have no interest whatsoever in the women. They have no interest or they have no any physical sexual desires. So it is these extremely old attendants in front of which also they can go about with their adornments. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his wisdom has permitted a circle 
has very has with wisdom pr permitted a circle in which a woman would want to look nice so it would be important for her that she she would be in a good form in front of all of them but beyond this circle be and this circle which allah has clearly allowed and has made permissible that she should show her adornments she should she she must she must be bothered about it that all these relatives and all those this circle around her she would look smart and she would look elegant and she would carry herself properly and they have a good impression about her but beyond this circle but beyond this circle it would just not matter for example why should be important to a woman that the gatekeeper the watchman the green grocer or the shoe mender what he thinks about her and why why in the world would she care or would she need to let the men beyond this circle beyond her near and dear circle see her adornments in fact revealing beyond this prescribed circle would be seriously would be seriously harmful not only for herself but also for the moral standards of the society may allah subhanahu wa taala help us understand this order and may allah guide us all to obey to adopt the order without any doubt without any doubt without any delay or without any form of postponements the leverage or the exemption is where allah has said illa ma zuhara minha this refers to what it refers to the condition in which unintentionally without any intention sometimes the adornments they might get revealed like for example a uh, strong wind blowing it opens up the wrapped headdress or there's a small child or a baby sitting in the lap of the mother or the sister and the baby pulls the veil down or pulls down or tugs to the headdress so that is exactly what is meant by this illama zuhara minha that other than all those which get shown by themselves and uh, that is exactly what has been mentioned for all the muslim women re regarding the adornments and the next order is that allah says and let them not stamp their feet to make known what they conceal of their adornments wala yadribna bi arjulihinna now this part of the verse is again a commandment and it instructs the muslim women how they have to walk about to walk like a modest woman because you know that even the style with which a, a woman walks it can be seducive it can be attractive and it can be inviting so the women have to have been taught to not to stamp about their feet and not to go about stamping their feet to catch attraction and to attract people towards them and to make them prominent and catchy and uh, it also restricts even the jingles of the ornaments which they might lead to catching attention and then the secret adornments all forms of concealed or secret adornments like wearing of perfumes etc has also been prohibited according to this verse as has been reported in a few traditions that um, uh, he ordered prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he ordered the women not to move about with perfumes according to hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala and who prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said do not stop the bondsmaids of allah from coming to the mosques but they should not come with perfumes it has been reported by abu daud and mustad ahmad similarly in another tradition hazrat abu huraira radhiyallahu ta'ala and who explained that he passed by a woman who was coming out of a mosque and filled and he felt that she had she was wearing a perfume and he stopped her and he asked her oh o oh bond maid of allah are you coming from the mosque and she replied in affirmative and he immediately added and he said that i have heard my beloved abu qasim muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam say that the prayer of a woman who comes to the mosque with perfumes is not accepted till she purifies herself with complete bath as is done after a physical relationship and it has been reported in abu daud ibn majah mustad ahmad and nisai 
And similarly, Abu Musa Ashri, radiyallahu ta'ala, and who he reports in Tarimdi, Abu Dawud and Nisai, that Prophet Sallallahu said, a woman who passes on the way with perfumes so that people may enjoy her perfume is such and such. And he used very harsh words for her. So this is exactly a form of a concealed adornment wearing the perfume by Muslim women to uh, reveal this concealed uh, adornment. And this is also not permissible for Muslim women in front of the non-mehram relatives, uh, non-mehram males. And uh, like if a woman is wearing uh, uh, any form of um, any form of a scent or a body spray, et cetera, or a roll-on, et cetera, or, or a anti-deodorant, um, antiperspirant, or a deodorant, the smell of which does not go beyond her own garments or beyond herself, then that can be per, uh, permitted for purposes of being hygienic, and that's it. But not a perfume, the smell of which is revealing and it spends beyond the person herself. And similarly, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also uh, not allowed the free mixing of women with men. In case of a genuine need, the women, they are allowed to speak to men. But um, even we do realize that Prophet Sallallahu wives themselves, they also used to instruct people regarding religious matters. But when there is no necessity or uh, there is no moral or religious objective, the women folk, they are not supposed to be heard by men also. As we know that in a congregational prayer, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we learn from the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that if the person who was leading the prayer, if uh, there was a lapse, the men have been, um, they've been told to say subhanallah, but the women, they've been just instructed to tap their hands only. And it's been reported in Bukhari, Muslim, Muslim Ahmad, uh, Muslim and uh, Muslim Ahmad, Tarimdi and Abu Dawud. So similarly, I would here also want to mention a few other uh, uh, orders from which we do learn from traditions of Prophet Sallallahu that Prophet Sallallahu also prohibited men even if they were relatives, to see a woman in privacy, a set or be with her in the absence of her mehram relatives. Has at the Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala and who he has reported that Prophet sallallahu said that do not visit the women whose husbands are away from home because shaitan circulates in one of you like blood. This has been reported in Tarimzi. Similarly, another tradition reported by Hazrat Jabir, Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever believes in Allah in the last day should never visit a woman when alone unless she has a mehram relative also present because the third one would be shaitan. This has been reported in Muslim Ahmad. Similarly, in another tradition reported by uh, Amr bin Rabia, uh, Prophet Sallallahu was extremely cautious himself and it has been reported in Abu Dawud that once he was uh, accompanying his wife as a Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha at night. And uh, there were two men of Ansar who passed by them on the way. And Prophet Sallallahu stopped them and he said, the woman with me is my wife Safiya. And they said, glory be to Allah, O messenger of Allah, could there be any suspicion about you? And Prophet ﷺ added, Shaitan circulates like blood in the human body. I was, afro- I was afraid lest he should put an evil thought in your mind. So how careful Prophet ﷺ was to um, not let people have assumption that he was doing something against it himself also. And uh, Prophet ﷺ did not approve that a man's hand should even touch the body of a non-mehram woman. And that is why we do learn the manner of Prophet ﷺ himself, that when he used to take oath from uh, the women who had embraced Islam, he would never, he would never take their hands in his hands. Although regarding men, they would take, he would take the uh, the hands of men in his hands. But as far as uh, Muslim women, when they were taking an oath, uh, we learn of different manners Prophet Sallallahu used to adopt. Like he used to just raise his right hands from far away and the women used to also raise their hands from far away. Or he used to hold to a rope or a string or a piece of cloth from one side and the women used to uh, hold them on the other side. Or he used to dip his hands in a, in a, 
uh, in a tub or something of water on one side and the women used to dip their hands on the other sides. So that it was, he never used to touch the body. The Taisha radiallahu ta'ala and how she reports in Abu Dawood that Prophet Sallallahu never touched the body of any other woman and he would administer the oath verbally to them. And when this was done, he would say, you may go and your oath is complete. And that was it. Similarly, Prophet Sallallahu has strictly prohibited the women from proceeding on a journey alone without a mahram or in the company uh, with, with, with a non-mahram. And it has been reported by Hazrat Ibn Abbas in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu was giving a sermon and he said that no man should visit the other woman when she is alone unless she has a mahram also present and no woman should travel alone unless accompanied by a mahram. And when Prophet Sallallahu was giving this sermon and he came up with these orders, a man stood up. And he said that my wife is going for Hajj while I am under order to join a certain expedition. And then Prophet told him that you may go for Hajj with your wife. And that is that you may not go to the, to the expedition and you will accompany your wife to Hajj. And there are other traditions also which have reported similar orders like um, Hazrat um, Abu Sayyid Khudri and Hazrat Abu uh, Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and who they have uh, reported in, um, in authentic books of tradition it has been reported that it is not permissible for a Muslim woman who believes in Allah and the last day that she should go on a journey without her mehram. And there are, however, variations with regard to the duration and the length of the journey. Some traditions lay down the duration and the length of the journey as a limit of 12 miles, and some lay down the tradition as one day and one night, and some limit it to just one day. Some mention two days, and even three days have been mentioned in some traditions. But the basic thing is that Prophet Sallallahu uh, might have given different instructions in different occasions depending upon the circumstances and the merit of each. But the principal thing we need to understand is that the women, they should not go on a journey without a mehram as has been laid down by all these orders of hadith. And uh, then Prophet Sallallahu not only ordered this in the words of hadith, he took practical measures. He also took practical measures to stop free mixing of uh, women and men. And uh, this was prohibited uh, not only verbally, but actually it was done in Medina. And we know that how important, how uh, important the congregational prayers are and how important the Eid and the Friday congregational prayers are in Islam. Like there is reported in a tradition that Prophet ﷺ said that if a person does not attend the mosque without a genuine reason and offers his prayers at home, it will not be acceptable to Allah. But in spite of this, Prophet ﷺ exempted the women from compulsory attendance at Friday prayers and also in the congregational prayers. <coughs> Despite the fact that how important both are, still to prevent free mixing, Prophet Sallallahu exempted the Muslim women from compulsory attendance at the Friday prayers and also in the normal five congregational prayers of the day. And as for the congregational prayers, he made Muslim uh, women's uh, attendance optional, saying that do not stop them if they want to come to the mosque. And at the same time, uh, he also made clarifications that it was better for the Muslim women to pray in their houses than in the mosques. And it has been reported by Ibn Umar and Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet said, do not prohibit the bondsmen, bonds, uh, the bondmaids of Allah from coming to the mosque of Allah, but permit the women to come to the mosques at night. This has been reported in Bukhari, Muslim Tarimzi. And uh, he said that do not stop your women folk from coming to the mosques, to, uh, though their houses are better for them than the mosques. And this has been reported in Musnad Ahmad and Abu Daud. So it is permissible for Muslim women to come to the mosques, to attend the congregational salah and to attend the fri Friday congregational salah, but they have to come according to the limits for their dress code and for the limits of their parda and for the limits of their face covering as 
as has been ordered according to the commandments of Quran. And there also has Prophet ﷺ advised that the better salah of a Muslim woman is that which she offers at her own house. And uh, there was a companion. She came to Prophet ﷺ and she said that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a great desire to offer my prayer under your, your leadership. And he replied, your offering the prayer in your room is better than offering it in the veranda. And your offering the prayer in your house is better than your offering it in the neighboring mosque. And your offering the prayer in the neighboring mosque is better than offering in the principal mosque of the town. And this has been reported in Mustad Ahmad. Similarly, Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood, uh, he reports in Abu Dawood, that uh, Prophet ﷺ said the best mosque for the women are the innermost portions of their house. So, and similarly, when um, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she, she observed the condition that was prevailing in the time of uh, the Banu Umayyah. She said that if Prophet ﷺ had witnessed such a conduct of women, he certainly would have stopped their entry into the mosques as was done in the case of the women of Bani Israel. And this has been reported in Bukhari, Muslim and Abu Daud. And uh, similarly, Prophet Sallallahu had appointed a separate door. There was appointed a separate door in his mosque for the entry of the women. And uh, Hazrat Umar, in his time, he had given strict orders prohibiting the men to use that door. And this has been reported in Abu Daud. And uh, in the congregational prayer, the women, they were instructed to stand separately behind the men. And at the conclusion of the prayer, Prophet Wasallam and his followers, they used to keep sitting for a while so that the women could leave the mosque before the men. And this has been reported in Musnad Ahmad and Bukhari. And uh, Prophet ﷺ would say that the best row for the Muslim men is the front row. And the worst is the last, which is nearest to the women's row. And the best row for the women is the rearmost row. And the worst row for the women is the front row, which is just behind the men. And this has been reported in Muslim and Abu Dawud. Similarly, uh, in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi women, they did join the Eid congregational Salah also, but still here, they had separate enclosures from men. And uh, after the sermon, Prophet Sallallahu used to address the women separately. And this has been reported in Abu Dawud and Bukhari. And uh, once outside the mosque, Prophet Sallallahu saw men and women, they were moving side by side in the crowd. And he stopped the women and he said, it is not proper for you to walk in the middle of the road, walk on the sides. And uh, we learn that on hearing this, the women immediately started walking along the roads, along the walls. And this has been reported in Abu Daud. And so we learn from all these traditions what all the commandments, they clearly show that mixed gatherings of men and women, they are wholly alien. They are wholly, solely alien to the temper of Islam. And uh, therefore, it cannot be imagined that the divine law, which disallows the men and the women to stand side by side for prayers, even for prayers in the sacred house of Allah, this, these commandments would allow them to mix freely in the colleges and the offices, clubs and other, other gatherings. There is no concept whatsoever of free mixing of Muslim men and women in any of these gatherings. And there is no concept whatsoever of Muslim women exhibiting and demonstrating their adornments in such gatherings whatsoever in any form. <coughs> So after getting knowledge of all these things from commandments from Allah and from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have like two courses. We, we have like two courses open before us that either we should, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make us one of this, that either we need to follow the commandments practically and purify ourselves and our family life and the society also from all the moral evils for the eradication of which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet sallallahu has given all these detailed commandments. Or Allah may not let us be among the second group, but if because of some weakness, the person does violate 
or one or more of the commandments, then the person should at least realize, the person at least needs to realize that the person is committing a sin and regard it as it is and should abstain from labeling it as a virtue by misinterpretation. And so apart from this, the third group who, who just adopt the Western ways of life against the clear injunctions of Quran and Sunnah, and they, they just try their utmost to prove that this itself is Islam and openly claim that there is no such thing as Parda in Islam and there's no such orders like all what we have, all these commandments that we have gone through. They not only they commit the sin of disobedience, but they also they dis, they, they display ignorance and they, they display what? They display hypocrisy and they display obstinacy, stubbornness and arrogance as compared to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us, may be one of those who are among the obedient among those who surrender, who submit when they learn the commandments of Allah and help us stay obedient when we have learned all the orders and all the commandments in total clarity. Verse number 32. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, وَآكِهُلْ أَيَّامَا مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِخِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ And marry. And marry the unmarried among you and the righteous among your male slaves and the female slaves. If they should be poor, Allah will enrich them from his bounty and Allah is all encompassing and knowing. So this is another order and this is another step for the eradication of immorality from a Muslim society that is to make provision of nikah to make provision of nikah for all those who are not married. This will do what? This will obviously, by provision of a spouse, will lead to satisfaction of the natural physical desires in a halal and in a lawful manner. And this will lead to eradication of immorality from the Muslim society. As has been reported in a tradition that Prophet said, An nikahu sunnati, wa mayyargabu an sunnati falaysa minna. Nikah is my sunnah. Nikah is my sunnah. Who turns away from my sunnah is not from among us. Similarly, Prophet guided Hazrat Ali and who's saying that Ali do not delay three things. Do not make delay in three things. Number one, offering first salah when the time of the salah starts, proceeding with the burial when the funeral is ready, and marrying off a daughter when you have found a suitable match. And similarly, it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet ﷺ said that when a father does not marry off his daughter when she reaches puberty, and she commits immorality, then the father will also share the burden of her sin. <coughs> you see, generally, if we look around, marriages are delayed and they are postponed for various reasons. And the most common reason is basically economic, economic reasons. Like parents, they delay marrying off their sons, and the boys themselves, they refuse, they refuse uh, to get married, thinking that they need to get economically stable to be able to support a family and a wife. And uh, uh, parents, they do not marry off their daughters and the girls themselves, they don't want to get, uh, get married early because, because of desire of letting them complete their postgraduate studies so that they can excel professionally to be able to earn a respectable living. So Prophet ﷺ has informed all of us in a tradition, he said, <coughs> which has been reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira anhu, that Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the charge that he himself will help and protect three people. That is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees, Allah is has guaranteed that he will uh, help and he will protect three people. And these three are the one who marries with a view to guard his chastity and the slave who wants to earn his freedom, that is by maqatibat, and the one who goes out to fight in the way of Allah. 
and this has been reported in Tirmizi, Nisa'i, Ibn Majah, and Muslim Ahmad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us be one of those who rely on the promises of Allah. And similarly, Hazrat um, Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who uh, relates that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once said that, O oh, young men, O oh, young men, whoso among you can afford to marry, he should marry because this will be a means of restraining the eyes from casting the evil look and of keeping one pure and chaste. And the one who cannot afford should fast because fasting helps cool down the passion. And it has been reported in Bukhari and Muslim. So this is here to promote and to encourage nikah as a method of uh, saving the Muslim society from all forms of immoral behaviors. But let them, but let them who find not the means for marriage abstain from physical relationship until Allah enriches from uh, enriches them from His bounty. And those who seek a contract for eventual emancipation from among whom your right hands possessed then make a contract with them if you know there is within them goodness and give them from the wealth of Allah which he has given you so now in this part of the verse is an order of makatibat what do we mean by makatibat this term means it refers to a deed of emancipation which is made between the owner and the slave. Entitling what? Entitling the slave to earn his or her freedom after the payment of an agreed sum of money in a certain period. That is, that if the slave just suggests the master that uh, asks the master that if you want to sell me, what price would you be asking for me? And after that, the slave suggests that if I pay you off this sum of money, which you will be asking for my price, if I happen to pay you off this money in a certain specified decided period, then I will succeed in buying off my freedom. So this form deal of emancipation between the owner and the slave is what? It is known as Makatibat, and this is what has been encouraged here, and the whole manner and the conduct of carrying this Makatibat has been guided here. This is one of the methods which was laid down in Islam for the slaves to attain their freedom. And um, it is not essential that the slave must always pay in cash. He can also earn his freedom by rendering some special services to the owner also, provided that both parties have agreed to it. And once the agreement is signed, then the owner is not entitled to put any obstacle in the way of the slave's freedom. He will have to provide opportunities to enable him to earn for his emancipation and shall have to free him when the agreed amount has been paid in the agreed time. In the time of um, Hazrat Umar, a slave entered into such an agreement with the lady owner. And uh, he also uh, managed to collect the amount in advance of the time limit. And when the amount was offered to the lady who was the owner, she refused to accept it on the ground that she would like to have it in monthly or yearly installments. And the slave came up to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and he complained. And Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he ordered that the amount should be deposited in the straight treasury and the slave be set free. And the lady was informed that her money lay in the treasury and she had the option to take it in lump sum or in yearly or monthly installments. So this was a decision, a very wise decision, which was made by Hazrat Umar ta'ala anhu. And here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, uh, if you know in them goodness, that it has been ordered to the master or the owner of the slave, that it is not mandatory for the master that he must go ahead with this deed of emancipation of uh, the slave. But it has been ordered here that if the master finds goodness, some form of goodness in the slave, then he should go about it. And what does this good mean? It implies th three things. Number one is that the first thing which it implies to is that the slave must be capable of earning his emancipation money through hard work and labor. That is through lawful means. And the second thing is that the slave should be honest truthful and reliable for the purpose of agreement. And the third and the most important thing is that the owner should make sure 
that the slave has no immoral trends and does not harbor feelings of enmity against Islam or Muslims, and nor there should be any apprehension that his freedom might prove harmful to the interests of the Muslim society, morally, religiously, or any form whatsoever. And then in this verse also, Allah says that give them of from their wealth, that Muslims should give the, the slave should be helped with the wealth of the Muslims themselves also. This means what? That uh, the owner has been instructed here that he should remit a part of the emancipation money. Hazrat Ali, radiallahu ta'ala, anhu, he used to remit a quarter of the amount and he used to, he exhorted others to do the same also. And the other thing is that the common Muslims, they are being instructed that they also should extend liberal help to all such slaves who have been, who have asked help for this regard. And one of the heads of zakat expenditures has also been laid down as the ransoming of the slaves. And ransoming of the slaves, the money of zakat can be used for this purpose also. And the third is that the Islamic government has also been advised to spend a part of zakat collections for the emancipation of slaves. This is all why to assist to assist for the freeing and for the freedom of the slaves in the Islamic society. <clears throat> and then Allah says, do not compel, do not compel your slave girls to prostitution if they desire chastity to seek thereby the temporary interests of the worldly life. And if someone should compel them, then indeed Allah is to them after their compulsion, forgiving and merciful. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering that the maid, the slave girls should not be compelled towards prostitution. Now, to understand the order, we would I would want to explain uh, to some extent the background and the circumstances which were prevalent at the time of order of uh, revolution of uh, this prostitution, which they were prevalent in those conditions, they were in two forms, the domestic prostitution and the open prostitution. The domestic prostitution was carried out by freed slave girls who had no guardians or by free women who had no family or tribal support. They would take residence in a house and they would enter into an agreement with a number of men simultaneously for financial help in return of their sexual gratification. And uh, whenever a child was born, this woman would name whomsoever she liked as his father, and the man also accepted it. It was a social norm, and this was established custom in the pre-Islamic days, and they were considered as um, almost analogous to marriage. And that was this was all forms of sa sexual gratification to be regarded as um, this order thus is, was regarded that all forms of sexual gratification which came other than nikah, it was regarded as adultery and it was a punishable offense in Islam. So this was one method of domestic prostitution. And the second method was open prostitution. This was also uh, carried out through slave girls. And this was like, the first was that the slave girls, they were obliged. The master uh, laid obligation on the slave girl to pay a fixed heavy amount every month to the owner. Disregarding how she earned, the master or the owner just uh, fixed on the slave girl that she would have to earn a fixed amount. And that was a very heavy amount that she will have to earn. And how did they earn was obviously then through prostitution. The owner knew fully well that how she earned the money, but there was no, um, it was not considered bad in the society. The second method in which it was carried out openly was that uh, beautiful young slave girls, they were made to stay in the brothel and a flag was put at the door. And this was with the purpose to indicate that any person who was uh, needy of sexual gratif uh, gratification could satif satisfy his last there. And such women, they were known as Qalikiyat, um, uh, and this place was known as the Mavakhir, and all the prominent men of the day, they owned and they maintained such houses of prostitution. Like we know that Abdullah bin Ubayy, the chief of the leader of the hypocrites of Medina, he had he had a place as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha 
explains that um, he had a regular house of prostitution in Medina, and there he had six beautiful slave girls. And uh, not only did he earn money through them, but he also used to oblige and to entertain his respectable and important uh, guests who came to see him from different parts of the world and from different parts of Arab to gain, uh, to trade with him and to do business dealings with him. And uh, he um, afterwards he used to employ the illegitimate children who, who were born because of all this to enhance the splendor and the strength of his army of slaves. And there it was Hazrat Ma'aza Raziallahu ta'ala anha, who was one of the slave girls of uh, Abdullah bin Umayyad. And she accepted Islam. And then she went over to Hazrat Umar Raziallahu ta'ala anhu, and she complained of the whole situation. And uh, she also offered repentance for her past sins. And Abdullah bin Ubay subjected her to torture, and he was not prepared to release her. And he forced her to carry on with this. Uh, prostitution, and she came over to Hazrat um, Abu Bakr Sadiq Raziallahu ta'ala and who, who brought it to the notice of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered that she should be taken away from Abdullah bin Ubay. And um, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been reported to inform about the income which is generated from the act of prostitution as one of the worst forms of income. <coughs> As has been reported in Abu Dawood, the Prophet said, there is no place for prostitution in Islam. In another words of Prophet which has been reported by uh, Rafi bin Khudaj, that Prophet explained such as earning, such an earning, that is an earning by prostitution as impure and a product of worst profession and the most filthy income, calling it as sharrul makasib. And it has been reported in Abu Dawood, Nisai, and Tarimsi. Similarly, according to Abu Huzaifa, he termed the money earned through prostitution as unlawful. And this has been reported in Bukhari, Muslim, and Musnad Ahmad. Abu Masood Uqba bin Amr, he says that Prophet Sallallahu forbade the people to take prostitutional earnings. And uh, in another commandment was that the slave girl, Prophet said that the slave girl could be employed for lawful manual labor, but the owner had no right to impose or to receive any money from her about which he was not sure how it had been earned. Similarly, Hazrat Rafi bin Khudaj explained in another tradition that Prophet prohibited, he prohibited the owner to accept any earning from the slave girl unless it was known that how she had earned it. And Prophet said that Prophet um, prohibited, he prohibited us from accepting anything from the earnings of a slave girl except that which she had earned through manual labor, such as, as Prophet indicated with his hands, like making of a baking of a bread or spinning of a cotton or carding wool or cotton. And this has been reported in Musa Ahmad and Abu Dawood. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu in accordance with the intentions of this verse, banned by religious instructions and the laws, all kinds of prostitutions, which was prevalent in Arab of those time in whatever form it was prevalent. And uh, we also learned that Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, uh, by the order of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all those slave girls, they were taken away from his ownership and they were set free because of these all these teachings. And um, at other times, there were these orders, clear-cut uh, injunctions for prohibition and being unlawful for all forms of prostitution in the Islamic society. And we have certainly sent down to you distinct verses and examples from those who passed on before you and an admonition for those who fear Allah. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah wal earth. This is the verse which brings the name to the chapter. A beautifully narrated parable in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in depth explains the attributes of Allah. Allah says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The example of his light is like a niche within which is a lamp 
the lamp is within a glass, the glass as if it were a pearly white star lit from the oil of a placid olive tree, neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil would almost glow even if untouched by fire. Light upon light, Allah guides to his light whom he wills, and Allah presents examples for the people, and Allah is knowing of all the things. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has narrated a beautiful parable explaining in depth the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Noor means what? Noor means the light of knowledge, the light of guidance and darkness. Az-Zulumat means what? It means it means ignorance. It means it refers to ignorance, which leads to being misguided and going astray. So the verse itself explains what? That Allah is the creator of all the light, of all the lights of heaven and earth. And Allah is the controller of all the lights and sources of light of the heaven and the earth. And third, that if there had not been Allah, there would have been no light and there would have been no nur. Now, nur refers to what? Nur refers to the light of all the heavenly bodies of the universe. And nur refers to the light of all artificial or natural sources of light in the, in the heavens and in the earth. And the noor also refers to the noor of the sight, of the vision, of the eye and the soul itself. So the light for guidance of Allah's bondsmen. Now, I would want to understand the example first, and then we will relate it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is a lamp in a niche, and the lamp is in a glass cover. And the glass cover is like what? It itself is which exaggerates the light which is being emitted by a lamp, by the lamp itself. So, and the, the lamp is being lit by an oil, which is from an olive tree. The oil of the olive tree is considered as like one of the best oils to be burned. And the light of the flame from the oil tree is considered to be the best and the glowing and the light and the color of the flame which comes from the oil from the olive oil is considered as best and then here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the oil of the olive tree is one which gets its light uh, which gets its light from the sun both from the east and the west so if the olive tree is being uh, is receiving light from the east and the west, that is from morning till evening, does the plant receive the sunlight, then obviously the quality of the fruit which will be yielded from this olive tree will be better. And obviously the oil which will be yielded from these olives of this tree, which is lit from the, which is, uh, which has sunlight shining on it from the west and the east continuously throughout the day, the oil will be of a better and a superior quality also. And the flame of this oil will again be even of a better quality. So what the verse explains is that the tree itself has all the factors which will brighten up the flame. So in this parable itself, uh, if we relate it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the masalu nuri he, if, um, if the he uh, points towards Allah, then the lamp refers to Allah. The lamp refers to Allah. The niche is the universe. And the glass cover, it refers to the whale. It refers to the whale of the unseen, due to which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen by the bondsman. But despite this whale, the light of Allah, the attributes of Allah, they are emitted to lighten up and show up in all the creations of the universe. All the creations of the creator, they themselves emit the light of the attributes of Allah for the recognition of Allah. And all the creations of Allah, they emit this light for the recognition of the attributes, of the powers, of the authority, of the sovereignty, 
and of the control of the creator. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with the recognition, with the comprehension, and with the belief of your power, of your control, your attributes, your authority, your sovereignty, and make us all of those who surrender to you, who submit to you in obedience, in humbleness, and make us all of their, all of them who stay away from all forms of obstinacy and stubbornness and arrogance and disobedience and transgression rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana zunubana wa qina adhab an-nar such such a nur is where such niches are in masks which allah has ordered to be raised and that his name to be mentioned there in exalting him within them in morning and evening are whom are men whom neither commerce nor sale distracts from the remembrance of Allah and performance of prayer and giving of zakah. They fear a day in which the hearts and eyes will fearfully turn about. So this nur or this light is available where? <coughs> so now in this verse 35 and 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained where we can get this nur and where all the bondsmen of Allah and the servants of Allah, they can acquire this nur and light is. Where is it available? For sure, it is not available over the counter. It is not available in any mall or any shopping mart. No, it is. This nur is accessible. It is available where in houses, in houses, which houses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to be constructed and ordered them to be raised. These are what it refers to the houses of Allah, the mosques and the gatherings of Allah, where people gather together to remember the orders, to remember the commandments of Allah and to glorify and praise Allah. And this nur we will be able to acquire from the mosques, from the gatherings of Allah and from the gatherings of the sessions of Quran and for the gatherings for remembrance of Allah. Why is it so? Because here are are all those people who remember Allah in under all conditions and all environments and all situations. That Allah may reward them according to the best of what they did and increase them from his bounty. And Allah gives provisions to whom he wills without an account. But those who disbelieved, their deeds are like a mirage in a low land, which a thirsty one thinks is water. <coughs> In a low land, which a thirsty one thinks is water, until when he comes to it, he finds it is nothing but finds Allah before him, and he will pay him in full his due, and Allah is swift in account. Allahumma hasibna hisa bin yasira. So now this example in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the condition of a disbeliever. The disbeliever who throughout his life is allured, is tempted, is attracted by the worldly desires and the worldly riches. He spends all his time, all his time, his energy, his efforts, all his time pursuing the worldly desires and the worldly riches running from one to another. The condition is just like a traveler in a desert. The traveler, when sees a mirage, when sees in a distant mirage, he sees, he, he travels, he travels hopefully to get to that place to get water. But when he reaches the place, he just finds what? He finds that there's no pool of water, but there's what? There's just glittering and shining sand. And then he sees another mirage. And then he starts moving towards the next just to find again glittering sand there. Similarly, is the condition of a disbeliever running after one to the other, running from one to the other worldly desires throughout the life till the person comes to the lifetime of death and there meets his Lord. Allahumma aini ala ghamaratil maut wa sakaratil maut. 
or they are whom the believers they are like darknesses within an unfathomable sea which is covered by waves upon which are waves over which are clouds darknesses some of them upon others when one puts out his hands therein he can hardly even see it and he to whom allah has not granted light for him there is no light so now in this example also allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the situation and condition of a disbeliever who is who is there diving and plunging in all forms of darknesses around him darknesses again here signify what a state of ignorance a state of being misguided and going astray the sea with its deep with its depth the mentioning of this unfathomable sea it it signifies what it signifies the heart of a disbeliever and the covering waves these are signifying what the covering waves they are signifying the causes of disobedience the causes of ignorance and the causes of not obeying and uh, following and believing the commandments of allah these waves they this uh, they signify what they signify the causes of disobedience being obstinacy there is a wave of obstinacy then there's a wave of stubbornness and then there is a wave of arrogance which leads to what these are all underlying triggering factors of ignorance and of disobedience and the clouds are signifying what the love the love of the world covering everything on top the love and the lust of this worldly uh, of this worldly wealth and all so in this frame of mind the hearts of the believers would tend to continue to go astray and to be ignorant and to be misguided this person who disbelieves is encompassed is encompassed from all the sides by darknesses and thereby the person stays deprived from the light of guidance from the nur of knowledge اللهم اجعل في قلبي نورا وفي سمعي نورا وفي بصري نورا وعن يميني نورا وعن يساري نورا وفوق نورا وتحت نورا وامامي نورا وخلف نورا واجعل لي نورا and do you not see that allah is exalted by whomever is within the heavens and the earth and by the birds with the wings spread in flights each of them has known his means of prayer and exalting him and allah is knowing of what they do and to allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and to allah is the destination do you not see that allah drives the clouds then he brings them together and then he makes them into a mass and you see the rain emerge from within it and he sends down from the sky mountains of clouds within which is hail and he strikes with it whom he wills and averts it from whom he wills the flash of its lightning almost takes away the eyesight allah alternates the night and the day indeed in that is a lesson for those who have vision allahumma ja'alna minhum Allah has created every living creature from water and of them are those that move on their bellies and of them are those that walk on two legs and of them are those who walk on four Allah creates of what he wills indeed Allah is over all things competent all these attributes are doing what they are guiding us to nur Allah to the recognition of Allah to the comprehension of the attributes of Allah we have certainly sent down distinct verses and allah guides whom he wills to a straight path allahumma ihdina sirat al mustaqim allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shururi anfusina but the hypocrites say we have believed in allah and in the messenger and we obey then a party of them turns away after that and those are not the believers allahumma tahhir qalbi min an nifaqi allahumma tahhir qalbi min an nifaqi wa amali min ar riya'i wa lisani min al qazabi wa aini min al khayanati innaka ta'lamu man khayna til aini wa ma tukhfi as sudur 
And when they are called to the words of Allah and his messenger to judge between them at once, a party of them turns aside in refusal. But if the right is theirs, they come to him in prompt obedience. Is there disease in their hearts or have they doubted or do they fear that Allah will be unjust to them or his messenger? Rather, it is they who are the wrongdoers. The only statement of the true believers when they are called to Allah and his messengers to judge between them is that they say, Sami'na wa atu'na, and those are the successful who are successful in this life and hereafter who do what? Sami'na, we have heard and they do what? After hearing, after listening, after understanding, after receiving, after comprehending, after believing, and after relating to the traditions of Prophet Wasallam and the messages of the verses and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may they be explained in Surah Nur, in Surah Nisa, in Surah Baqarah, in Surah Al-Ahzab, whatever, wherever come the commandments to them, the believers, those who will be successful here and hereafter are those who say what? Samirna wa atwana, we hear and we obey. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allah make us one of them. Allah make us one of them. Allah make us one of them who listen to the orders and commandments of Quran and Hadith and are those who are the lucky ones to obey them, to submit and to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever obeys Allah and his messengers and fears Allah, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha, fears Allah and is conscious of him, it is those who are the attainers. And they swear by Allah their strongest oaths that if you order them, they would go forth in Allah's cause. Say, do not swear, such obedience is known. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what which, which you do. Say, obey Allah and obey the messenger. But if you turn away the commandments of Surah Nur, the commandments of Surah Ahzab, the commandments of Surah, uh, Surah Nisa and uh, Surah Baqarah, you've, you start finding them difficult to obey. You start finding that you will end up with social, psychological, emotional crises. Then it will become difficult for you and life will become tightened up for you. Then if you turn away, what will happen? Then upon him is only the duty with which he has been charged. And upon you is that which you have been charged. And if you obey him, you will be rightly guided. And there is not upon the messenger except the responsibility for clear notification. Allah has promised those who have believed among you and done righteous deeds, however difficult it might have been obeying them. Allah has promised those who have believed among you and does righteous deeds that he will surely grant them succession to authority upon the earth, just as he granted it to those before them, and that he will surely establish for them their in their religion, which he has preferred for them, and that he will surely substitute for them after their fear and security for they worship me, not associating anything with me, but whoever disbelieves, whoever disbelieves after that, then those are defiantly disobedient. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And establish prayer and give zakah and obey the messenger that you may receive mercy. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. Never think, never think that the disbelievers are causing failure to Allah upon the earth. Their refuge will be the fire and how wretched the destination. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. O you who have believed, let those whom your right hands possess and those who have not yet reached puberty among you ask permission of you before entering three times. These three times are what? Before the dawn prayer and when you put aside your clothings for rest at noon and after the night prayer. These are the three times of privacy for you. There is no blame upon you nor upon them beyond these periods for they continually 
they continually circulate among you, some of you among others. Thus, does Allah make clear to you the verses Allah is knowing and wise. Allah all knowing and Allah all wise here is giving us some orders and commandments regarding the domestic ethics, taking permission on even inside the house. Taking permission even inside the house has been instructed for two categories. Two categories, the young children who have not yet reached puberty, and the second is the slaves or the attendants of the house. They, these two categories have been ordered to, they, they've been ordered to be trained and to be instructed to take permission on three timings. That is before the Fajr Salah, that is after the Isha Salah, and during the noon while taking a nap or something. Because this is what, these are the three timings when the night garments are, uh, they are generally adopted. And in these days, it is the order is slightly different. But in those days, we learn that uh, the houses, they were simply constructed. And there were no doors, there were no curtains, there were no bolts, there were no latches, nothing of the sort whatsoever. So instructions were given to the parents to teach and to educate and to instruct that the servants, the attendants and the slaves, may they be the slave girls or they may be the men or the women slaves and the pre-pubertal children, the young children instructed that in these three times, which are the times of privacy for the husband and wife, they should take permission before they enter their rooms and their private areas. Now, the purpose was to ensure privacy, to ensure privacy for the husband and wife during the retiring hours. And this was, this order was given to prevent the exposure of the young children. So the two purposes, number one is to ensure the privacy of the husband and wife in the retiring hours. And the second and the main purpose was to prevent the exposure of the young children to marital matters which they are unaware of. And moreover, they need not know anything about them also. So to prevent them to see something or to hear something or to experience something of the marital physical relationships, which they should not know and they do not know of also. But you know what is happening in these modern periods of today is that in our modern homes, there is, uh, there is no problem and there is no issue regarding ensuring the privacy for the husband and wife, because we have all forms of doors and latches and every forms of things to ensure privacy in the private hours is no issue. But what is being done is wrong is that children, despite this order, why it was issued and why it was instructed to order the children to take permission Despite this commandment, the children are being provided with all forms of electronic gadgets. All forms of electronic gadgets ranging from a huge wall-mounted LED in their living area to a laptop, a tab, a mobile with an internet access so that they have an access, they have an access to all which was actually being prevented to be accessible to them through this order. Allah was giving this order just because Allah did not want them to have access to all these things. Now, access to all those things was just now, is just now available with a single tap. With just one single tap, the child can watch, can, the child can listen, one single tap, the child can watch or listen to all what can change the thought process of the child for the rest of their lives. I will urge all of you, I will request all of you to be extremely, extremely vigilant regarding all these tools of shaitan which are being provided to the young children. Do not provide them other than what is actually needed. What is actually needed, do not provide them anything extra beyond that. Which is actually needed, just provide them that. And even when you provide all that, be with them, be around them, check them, supervise them, and talk to them 
be friends with them so that you know what they need to ask, what they want to find out, what is going out in the factory of their little minds and brains, what they are up to. So I would really urge all of you to be very, very sensitive, be very, very mindful and careful about when you are providing them all these tools of shaitan. And when the children among you reach puberty, let them ask permission at all the times as those before them have done. Thus, does Allah make clear to you his verses and Allah is knowing and wise. Verse number 60. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is mentioning and saying, وَالْقَوَاعِدُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ اللَّاتِ لَا يَرْجُونَ نِقَاحًا and when women of old age, here the translation mentions post women, post menstrual women, I will be definitely explaining about it immediately now. Allah says, and women of post menstrual age who have no desire for marriage, there is no blame upon them for putting aside their outer garments, but not displaying adornment but to modestly, modestly refrain from that is better for them. And Allah is hearing and knowing. So now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing and giving an order and giving an exception to a specific age group of women, the elderly women. They are being given some exep exemptions regarding their parda, regarding their dress code that they will they will be they can lay aside their outer garments which they were ordered to adopt to conceal their adornments the muslim women they have been ordered to conceal their adornments and for that they have been ordered to adopt some outer clothes inshallah we will be talking about all those in detail in um, surah al ahzab so Allah ordered them, Yudhinina alayhinna min jilabi bihin, the outer garments, the outer clothes, which the Muslim women, they have been ordered to wear on top of their garments and on, on top of their adornments to conceal, to conceal their adornments. They have been given exemption under certain age, in a certain age, under certain conditions, with certain limitations. They have been given uh, exemption to take off their outer garments. Now, the first thing which we need to understand is that which category is being given an option and an exemption. This is very important to understand. Here is mentioned that it is the post-menopausal women. It is not so because the word is al qawaidu the women who keep sitting. al qawaidu refers to the women all aged women who just keep sitting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he had to say post-menopausal women could have, could have used the term specifically, could have used rightly the words as they have been used in Surah At-Talaq regarding the orders of um, idda, idda in, um, in divorce issues. Allah says, that those girls who have not started menstruating or Allah says, mahiz, that those women who have been disappointed from menstruation, that is the postmenopausal woman. So if it was meant to be the age of uh, postmenopausal women, the term could have been rightly used. But the term which has been used is al qawaidu min al nisa. So it is instead what? It refers to the women who are sitting. Most of the time who are sitting, these are the women who are like extremely old women, who are weak, debilitated women, who can hardly walk across, who just can't walk across or who just can't walk very easily. And they keep on sitting most of the time. These generally are women. They generally stay at home. They stay indoors. No shopping, no winter shopping, no hoteling, no dining out, no visiting of the parlors, no going around to the designers, to the parties, and to any form of social gatherings. They usually walk, usually uh, very difficultly, they find it difficult to walk. 
just for the cause of necessity, they walk around and they walk even with somebody's help. And uh, 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 they prefer sitting most of the time. And uh, they just are the women who in this condition, they have no interest. They have lost interest for all forms of adornments, for all forms of things related to marriage or for any form of physical sexual gratification. They have lost all interest. They have no attraction for the opposite sex or for physical desires. So such an old lady who just finds it difficult to walk around, might be she is using a walking aid or might be she is using the support of the hand of her of her son for a support she will be she might be having a haunched back or she has a hurting knee or hazy vision she might even stumble off she might stumble off with all those heavy outer garments on top so she is being granted permission to lay aside not all her garments. She is not being allowed to strip over her clothes. She is just permitted to take her outer garments for the sake of her convenience. But that is an exemption which is strictly conditioned that she does not have any desire of revealing or showing off her adornments. Even if she, even if this old lady still has the desire if she even has any form of desire of exhibiting and showing up and demonstrating her adornments, then she will not be granted this permission also. And moreover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moreover also mentions that even if she carries on modesty and she refrains from taking off her garments, it will be better for her. Remember, it is not a post-menopausal woman. It is not a woman who is 50 plus with all the desires. A woman who is postmenopausal today is a woman who is like 50 plus. She has all forms of desires. She has all form of desires to look young, to, to, long, to look youthful, to, to look smart, stylish, elegant. And Allah has also has mentioned that this old lady, if she does not have any desire, it would be still better for her if she carries on with this outer garments, if she, if she modestly remains from, restrains from taking off these outer garments. Because you know that even this lady, even despite the fact that she does not have any desire to show off her adornments, she still happens to be the grandmother. She still happens to be the grandmother, the granny of a granddaughter who is observing her. So if she carries on this dress code and she adopts this dress code, it will be still better for her. The granddaughter observing the granny going still about in the outer garments, we will be, she will be conveying a message of this modest dress code for the Muslim women also. So the granny at this stage is still preferable for her to carry on in the same dress code. Now, going through all these commandments and orders of these verses of the Quran, what do you think? What do we need to assume that what would Allah want regarding the young, the youthful, the beautiful girls, Muslim girls? How would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Prophet wasalam, want, want the Muslim young, youthful, beautiful young girls to go about in a Muslim society? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand and comprehend and obey the commandments of Allah. Verse 61. There is not upon the blind any constraint, nor upon the lame constraint, nor upon the ill constraint, nor upon yourselves when you eat from your own houses or the houses of your fathers or the houses of your mothers, or the houses of your brothers, or the houses of your sisters, or the houses of your father's brothers, or the houses of your father's sisters, that is the paternal uncles and aunts, or the houses of your mother's brothers, or the houses of your mother's sisters, that is the maternal uncles and aunts, or from the houses whose keys you possess, or from the houses of your friends. There is no blame upon you, whether you eat together 
are separately. But when you enter houses, give greetings of peace upon each other, a greeting from Allah, blessed and good. Thus does Allah make clear to you the verses of ordinance that you might understand. So from this, uh, or this verse, what we can clearly understand is that it states that the handicapped person can have his meal anywhere and at any house in order to satisfy his hunger because the society, the Muslim society as a whole, owes him this privilege on account of his handicap. And uh, as for other people, for them, their own houses and the houses of their relatives, which have been mentioned in the, in the verse in detail, they are equally good for the purpose. And uh, there's no need of formal invitation or permission is needed to have meal at their houses. And in the absence of the master, if his wife or children offer something, it can be taken without hesitation. So in this connection, it should be noted that the houses of our own children are just like own houses. And the friends here imply what? The close, intimate, near and dear friends. <coughs> the believers are only those who believe in Allah and his messenger. And when they are meeting with him for a matter of common interest, do not depart until they have asked his permission. Indeed, those who ask your permission, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those are the ones who believe in Allah and his messenger. So when they ask your permission for something of their affairs, then give them permission to whom you will among them and ask forgiveness of, for them of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Do not make your calling of the messenger وسلم, among yourselves as the call of one of you to one another. Already, Allah knows those of you who slip away, concealed by others. So let those be aware who descend from Prophet Sallallahu order, lest fitna strike them or a painful punishment. So here, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is mentioning about du'a al rasul. Du'a means uh, number one to summon, to pray, or to call. So du'a al rasul means summoning. Uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or praying a supplication of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or calling uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the verse can have three meanings uh, which will be equally correct. The first is that when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this order relates to the companions in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that his summoning should not be treated as a common man's summon. Like when Prophet Sallallahu used to uh, summon and used to call the companions to do something or to offer some expedition, it was of an extraordinary importance and they, it could not be ignored. And if they failed to respond to it or they felt hesitant about it, then they would be obviously risking their fate. And uh, as far as the rest of uh, the believers after the life of Prophet ﷺ, this would mean what? That anybody being asked for or called out for help in the cause of Allah, like anybody calling man ansari illallah for the cause of preaching and teaching of the messages of Quran and Hadith for the purpose of dawah and for the struggle or the efforts of implementation of uh, the messages of Islam. If somebody calls this summoning, for the protection of Prophet Sallallahu religion and teaching, this summoning should not be considered as a normal invitation by the followers. And this should be taken serious too and should be answered as what? Man ansuari illallah should be answered as what? Nahnu ansuarullah. So this is the first message. And the second thing is that uh, we all, and even the companions of Prophet Sallallahu they have been instructed that they should not consider Prophet Sallallahu supplications as the supplications of a common man. Because we know that uh, the supplications of prophets and even Prophet Sallallahu were heard. And if he is pleased with you, Allah is conveying it to all the companions that if Prophet Sallallahu is pleased with you and prays for you, then there can be no greater fortune for you. And if he is displeased with you and he curses you, then there can be no greater misfortune for you. Like Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has said, that the nearest and dearest to me on the day of judgment will be the one 
whose behavior and whose conduct and whose manners are good and the most disliked and the farthest away from me on the day of judgment will he be whose manners are not nice and they are not good. That is, he's ill-mannered and he is short-tempered. And similarly, Prophet ﷺ has prayed and he said, imran sami'a minna, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the person happy and contented and peaceful and also fresh. The person who gathers or hears something from me and passes it on to others. So these supplications and these uh, informations which have been passed on by Prophet Sallallahu these should not be considered as pieces of information or orders or supplications as made by any other person. And the third message with this verse conveys is that calling out the name of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should not be taken like uh, we call each other amongst ourselves. Like if we call anybody around us, it's not going to be in a similar manner that we should call out the name of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what should we be doing? We should be reciting the rule when we take the name of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because this itself is obligatory for all the Muslims. And this itself is a, is a commandment of Allah where Allah says, Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima, that you do what? You send the rood, you recite the rood from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whenever you mention his name or whenever his name is mentioned in front of you. And in a tradition, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the worst of all forms of misers, the worst form of miserliness is what? Is of a person in front of whom Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's name is mentioned and he does not recite the rood. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Allah help us all recite plentiful of the root, the, the root for which Prophet Sallallahu has promised and has mentioned that if a person recites the root once, then he will be he will be given 10 blessings and 10 grades will be raised and 10 rewards will be blessed to him and 10 sins will be forgiven. And as long as the person keeps on reciting the, the root, then by the order of Allah, uh, an angel will be appointed behind him and the angel will go on sub Applicating for the person and seeking forgiveness for the person as long as the person goes on reciting the root. And similarly, we do learn from traditions that Prophet has promised all of us that a person who recites the root after the proclamation of Salah, that is after the Azan, and then makes supplication, which has been taught to us by Prophet after the root. And similarly, has also been promised that any person who recites the root 10 times in the morning, that is after the Salah of Fajr, and 10 times in the evening. Evening, that is after the Salah of Asr, then Prophet Sallallahu for both these activities, Prophet Sallallahu has promised that he will be, he will be interceding for this person. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Unquestionably to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Already he knows that upon which you stand and knows the day when they will be returned to him and he will inform them of what they have done. Allah is knowing of all the things. Rabbana innana amanna faghfir lana zanubana wa qina azab an-nar wa qina azab al-qabri wa qina azab al-hashri wa qina azab al-mizan wa qina azab an-nar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the light to guidance of the righteous path bless us all with the knowledge of the commandments of Quran and hadith help us all help us all learn and remember comprehend and believe in the teachings of Quran and Hadith. Help us all obey and act upon the commandments of Quran. Forgive us all. Forgive us all what we have wronged. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. Allahumma innaka afuvan karimun tuhibbul affa fa'fu anna fa'fu anna fa'fu anna استغفر الله ربي من كل ذنب واتوب اليك اللهم اجعلني من التوابين واجعلني من المتطهرين forgive all what we've wronged forgive all what we heard and you disliked forgive all what we saw and was prohibited forgive all what we read 
and what was not lawful for us, forgive all what we wore, forgive, forgive us all what we wore and was not, was not permissible for us, forgive all what we talked, what we, what we said and we hurt others or we dishonored others or we made others cry, forgive all of our sins, major sins or minor sins, forgive all the sins from all of us, from all of us, may they be major or they be minor. May be they revealed, may they be concealed. May we be knowing them, may we have forgotten them and you might have got them written. Allah, astaghfirullah rabbi min kulli zambin wa tubu alayk. Allahumma gfir lana walil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat. ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين